I'm Alison. I am a listed building caseworker with the Council for British Archaeology um, and also the database coordinator for the Joint Committee for National Immunity Society's listed building casework database. And I'm going to be talking about historic building conservation and why that needs to be a key part of sustainability planning going forward. So um, the title of my presentation comes from a quote from the former president of the American Institute of Architects who said that the greenest building is the one that already exists. And that kind of runs counter to what a lot of people think about historic buildings. They think they're very drafty, they think they're really hard to heat, um, and they're poorly insulated, and um, that modern buildings are better in sustainability terms. So it's true that historic buildings quite often need a certain amount of retrofitting and work in order to meet modern sustainability standards. That's something where techniques um, and materials for that are improving all the time. So it's certainly possible for historic buildings to meet modern energy saving standards um, in a sensitive way that maintains their historic interest. On the other hand, when it comes to demolishing them and replacing them with a modern energy efficient building, that's a huge carbon cost. So currently about 40% of Europe's energy demand comes from buildings and construction. 11% of that is construction alone. So that is creating materials, extracting materials, transporting materials, and actually building a site. So it's, there's just a massive amount of waste within the construction industry. And really the only way to deal with that is to create fewer buildings and adapt the ones that already exist. Um, I obviously have an interest in pushing this agenda. Um, I am a listed building caseworker um, and I spend most of my time telling people not to knock down old buildings, please. Um, so I work with the Council for British Archaeology. Um, a lot of you here will probably know the CBA better from our kind of public engagement work, uh, the Young Archaeologists Club, things like that, but we are also have a statutory role in the planning process. Um, so local planning authorities in England and Wales are legally required to notify the CBA of planning applications which affect listed buildings. So we look at about 4,000 planning applications a year. Um, we have discretion on what we respond to, we don't have to reply to all of them, fortunately. Um, but we have specific priorities that we work to within that. Um, so the CBA focus on a buildings archaeology approach, which means we look at the evidential value within buildings. We look at what you can learn from a building and how it's evolved over time and what that tells us about the interactions between people and place, buildings and landscape, um, changing lifestyles, changing expectations of a building and what that does for people and what they want from their building. Um, we focus specifically on vernacular and industrial buildings. Um, so we see a lot of farm buildings, um, a lot of quite more functional buildings. There are other amenity societies who will focus more on the aesthetic and the evidential value and the architectural value of buildings, particularly buildings that were built at specific times and are really good examples of particular architectural styles. We're more interested in the building as an archaeological record and what we learn from that. Um, we do also look at bigger planning applications, so um, developments that might have archaeological potential. So as Tom was talking about earlier, we really encourage local planning authorities to write, require community engagement as part of the tender for any development. So to make sure that right from the start there is funding available for development projects as they go forward to make sure that the archaeology done there has real communal and public benefit. Um, other ways we try to enhance communal value is by um, making sure that buildings that are really locally um, popular, really well used, things like pubs and cinemas and the kind of the local assets that have really strong connections for people. We prioritise those within our casework. And the last um, focus, which has been more and more of our workload lately is adaptive reuse. And what we mean by that is the reuse of buildings, their adaptation, their as necessary changes to their form or to their function to make sure that they can be used in future. Um, 
The classic example here is a barn conversion. So it was an agricultural building. They don't need it as an agricultural building anymore. It doesn't work as that. The options are to alter it, usually into a house, um, or to just let it fall down because it's not being used. So adaptive reuse is a really positive way to make sure that buildings are conserved and used and loved in the future and that we don't need to construct more um, unnecessary buildings and waste materials. So I've got a few examples of cases that I've worked on. Um, so this is on the Isle of Wight. It's behind that horrendous 20th century block on the front. That is a 19th century building. Sorry, you can't see it over there. Um, so that is the core and the structure of a 19th century building. It's being used as flats. Um, the, it's, it's a little bit run down, but it's structurally sound. The developer wants to knock it down and rebuild it with a little extra bit stuck on the side where that side extension is, a slightly larger side extension. So basically they want the same building back, but new. Um, this is in Dartmoor. It's probably 17th century with a lot of little adaptations and developments over time. Um, it's not in a conservation area, but it is in a national park. So that's how it came to us. Um, it's, again, the proposal is to knock it down and build a new small domestic building where that is, that's basically the same size and shape. This is in Framlingham in Suffolk, and this has been a really controversial local case. Um, the developers who want to knock this down and rebuild it originally proposed to repair it and reuse it. So applying application for that passed, and they didn't do it. Um, and they've sat on it for about, I think, 10 to 12 years now. And now they're saying, actually, it turns out it's quite neglected. So can we knock it down? <laughs> Um, so the Suffolk Preservation Society are very upset about this. It's in a very sensitive historic area. There is a lot of listed buildings around it. It's very prominent in the village and it's an increasingly rare example. You don't get many of these weatherboarded buildings. It's 18th century. It's timber framed inside. A lot of the timber framing about five years ago was really well preserved. I'm not sure about now. Um, but yes, yeah, so again, there's a proposal to demolish this and replace it with a your classic new suburban house with a brick frontage and some nice gables. Um, West Sussex, obviously very prominent as viewed from the river entrance to Appledrum, which was a really popular way for people to enter the village historically. They come across the ferry on over the river. This would be kind of the first view of the village that they would see. So this building dates from about 1900. Um, it's designed by Temple Lushington Moore who, apart from having a great name, was quite a prominent late Victorian architect. So there's a bit of architectural value there. Um, again, structurally sound. Um, there have been some kind of slow changes done to this building. So it's adapted over time. Um, some, a lot of those have been external, actually. So it's had a few windows moved around, had a bit of redecoration on the outside. So it doesn't look exactly as it was originally designed to look anymore. So um, the theory for this one was that they were going to um, knock this down and replace it with a proper Victorian building. So they were going to recreate a fake arts and crafts building that would look how they thought an arts and crafts building should look. And they were saying that this was going to be better for the heritage of the building because it would clearly be a Victorian building. It would be a fake Victorian building, but it would clearly be Victorian. So this would be a positive um, historic landscape point. Um, so we objected to that, the Victorian Society objected to that, that's an ongoing case. So what all of these have in common is that they are functionally usable buildings. There is no big development being planned which requires them being flattened. You know, they're not going to make way for a train station or an entire new school. They're just going to be replaced by another building that's the same, but a little bit newer. And um, from our perspective, you've got a building here that stood for 100 years, 200 years, 400 years in some cases. That's obviously very sustainable. It's very structurally sound. It's with the right maintenance and care, it's going to last for another however many hundred years. 
Um, and if you oppose that to modern building standards, which often expect a building to last for 40 or 50 years before it gets replaced, the wastage of materials and of construction energy going into that is a real concern. Um, and the other thing these all have in common is that these are cases which I have specifically objected to in the last six weeks. So I only had to go back to about the middle of February in my casework to find these. So extrapolate that out to, um, do I mean extrapolate? Expand that out. Multiple caseworkers, I only deal with the South of England Southwest. Um, multiple caseworkers, multiple planning authorities, years at a time, and the cases that we never find out about. So these were mostly sent in because local campaigners really wanted some backup and they wanted some help, or in some cases the local conservation officer wanted backup. There is no legal requirement to consult us on these because none of these buildings were listed. They're all locally listed or in conservation areas or non-designated heritage assets. So this is obviously a big nationwide um, issue. It's an event that's happening across the country where old buildings are getting replaced by new buildings for no reason other than that the new buildings are slightly, possibly easier to manage um, and that they look better in sustainability terms because they'll meet all these requirements without any work being done. So, what would I like to see change? So these are the key issues that we're focusing on at the moment to try and really improve this in practical terms. So the first one is BAT reduction. Um, historic building caseworkers have been talking about this for decades. Currently, the VAT on new building is 0%. For the repair and um, maintenance of existing buildings, it's 20%. So for developers, there is a financial incentive to demolish and rebuild. Um, so we're really, really trying to um, get planning policy, uh, get VAT rates changed so that for, at least for historic buildings, repair is at 0% VAT. Um, we would like better protection for non-designated heritage assets and locally listed buildings. So as I said, all those buildings on the previous slide, they weren't listed, they were historic, they were really locally popular and valued. Um, but there is, unless it's specifically written into the local plan for a local authority, there is no assumption in favour of the retention of non-designated heritage assets. There was a case in Bath recently. Um, there was a case in Bath recently where um, a developer applied for planning permission to demolish a locally listed building. It had over 300 objections from local people. It was turned down. So they passed the case through permitted development because there's nothing in the permitted development rights that says you can't just knock it down if you want to and replace it because it wasn't designated. So we would like national planning policy to state that there's a presumption in favour of the retention of non-designated heritage assets. And finally, we want carbon assessments to take into account the construction and lifespan of a building. So currently, um, the carbon assessments that are submitted for new development only take into account the operational carbon. So that's how much it costs to maintain a building, to heat it, to run it. They don't take into account demolition and rebuild. So when you consider that, quite often you realise that the greener option is to re retain the building that is already there. Um, and that's actually something which is, has been recommended for part of the new planning policy as it comes forward. The levelling up and regeneration bill is a really good opportunity for us to get some of this put in place. Um, and excitingly, there is going to be a test case decision coming out. I had to check the news this morning to make sure it didn't come out while I wasn't looking. Um, this is the Marks and Spencer's flagship store in Oxford Street. They want to, again, demolish that, rebuild it, essentially the same, but a story higher. This has gone to a public inquiry. So a decision in, is due on this early in May, and this is going to be a real test case for whether the carbon cost of replacing a historic functional building is sufficient reason to turn down its replacement. So that's gonna be really interesting. Keep an eye out on that. Um, I'm really sorry, I won't be able to stay for questions, but do email me if you want to talk about it.